Howdy folks, this is Professor Ryan and what I want to do in this warm up here is I want you to practice doing something that you already know how to do, well really two things that you already know how to do and when I take those two things that you already know how to do and you do them it will produce a new kind of knowledge. Now what you're looking at here is a coordinate plane. Now in a math class you're probably accustomed to seeing an, a Y up here instead of a P and an X down here instead of a Q but here's one of the things that I want you to understand. In uh, economics we often use um, this co the coordinate plane. Uh, this is quadrant one because you'll see that this is the origin down here. Here is the vertical axis and here's the horizontal axis but instead of calling this the Y axis we're going to call it the P axis and P is representing the price of a product. Okay, It's dollars per unit. Uh, so for every one unit, like if I buy five cheeseburgers and they're $1.50 each, the price is $1.50. That's the price for every one unit and then I'm buying five of them. Uh, the Q is on the horizontal axis and that is representing the quantity that is purchased. So if a cheeseburger, well let's change it, if a cheeseburger was $3 and I bought five of them, I could go up to the three here on the vertical axis and that represents $3, right? And then I could go over to one, two, three, four, five on the horizontal axis, and that will represent buying five cheeseburgers at three dollars each, and that would represent this point right here. Okay? And so then the question is this if this is price and this is quantity, then every one of these dots here represents a combination of price and quantity that's being purchased in a market. Okay? Uh, and we'll talk, that's what we're going to be talking about in this unit is markets. Uh, now you already learned uh, how to calculate total revenue and if you didn't learn how to uh, calculate what's called total revenue because you see the instructions say calculate the total revenue for each coordinate. Okay? If you didn't learn how to calculate total revenue I'm going to show you the revenue of a business, total revenue that a business is earning from a transaction or from a group of transactions is equal to the price times the quantity. And so for the cheeseburgers, how much money did that business earn when I bought five cheeseburgers at three dollars each? Well all we have to do is multiply the five, the quantity, and the three dollars, the price, the total revenue would be three, three dollars, times five, and that would be fifteen dollars. Okay? And so what I want you to do now is I want you to pause the video and for each one of these points there's I think seven of them two three four five six seven for each one of those points I want you to calculate the total revenue that that business earned from that transaction based on the price vertically and quantity horizontally okay go ahead and try that alright so let's go over each one of these uh, let's start with this dot up here. We can see that that dot is at the coordinates 1, 2, 3 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this is the point 3, 9 and that 9 would be in dollars because it's the price. So a quantity of 3 here and a price of 9, 9 dollars, 9 dollars, quantity of 3, okay. Uh, and if we multiply them for total revenue, price times quantity, 9 times 3, that's $27. So total revenue would be equal to $27 for this dot right here. Okay? Let's try this, this green dot down here. Looks like we have a quantity of 1, 2, 3, 4. We have a quantity of 4 and a price of 1, 2. Price of $2. So that this point is 4, comma, and $2. Okay? And so the total revenue of this, for this transaction would be four times two dollars which is eight dollars. That's an eight dollar transaction. How about this one here? Looks like we have a quantity of five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And then we're going up one, two, three, four. So that's four dollars. So for this transaction each one was sold for four dollars and they sold five of them. So five quantity for four dollars each. 5 times 4 is $20. So the total revenue here is $20. Okay. Moving over to this one, we got 5, 6, 7, 8. 
This one has a quantity of 8 with a price of 1, 2, 3. It's on the same uh, line that we, we had looked at previously, so that's $3. So this one is going to be 8 quantity for $3 each, and 8 times 3 is $24. So that means total revenue for that transaction is $24. Just a couple more here. Let's do this dot next. So we've got 9, 10, 11, 12. That's a quantity of 12. So go 12, put a 12 here, for a price of 1, 2, 3, 4 at $4 each. And so 12 times 4, that's $48. So total revenue here is $48. And then let's do this dot way up here. That's kind of out of, out of the way here, but we'll still do it. Quantity of 12, this one's a quantity of 13. All right, so that's a quantity of 13. And then for a price of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so that's $8 at, thir uh, excuse me, I wanted to put the 8 second. We'll do 13 at $8. 13 times 8 is 80 times uh, 80, that's $104. And this last one here, total revenue is $104. And then now for this last one right here, uh, our quantity is 14. We're going over one more for a quantity of 14 and a price, but the price is really cheap. It's only $2 each. So at this point, we'll do a 14 comma $2 and 14 times 2, that's 28. So total revenue for this point is going to be $28. Okay. And so hopefully you're getting the feel for this coordinate plane that has price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. Okay. Um, and now we're going to move into uh, learning about markets. What we're going to do in this video uh, is I'm going to explain a concept uh, that's well known uh, in economics, uh, well at least among economics folks. Uh, it, you'll, prob you'll see it in pretty much any economics textbook. Uh, it's kind of a very, um, like a bread and butter concept in economics and so it's really essential that you have this basic uh, it's, a, it's a diagram have this basic diagram uh, in your notes so make sure that if I write it you write it in your notes try to draw the diagram very similar to the way that I'm going to draw it but what it's called is it's called the circular flow diagram or the circular flow chart so I'm gonna write up here circular flow diagram. And here's the idea. The idea in the circular flow diagram, uh, you've probably already heard me say at this point that um, two of the major players in any economy it, are the, the businesses, which we call firms, and the individuals uh, that consume, uh, or the groups of individuals, we call that households. And so, um, so what we have, what I'm going to put over here is Households, uh, so I'll write households. All right, now households are our people, okay? Human beings, okay? Households, and then over here on this side of the diagram, I'm going to put uh, firms, uh, which, which basically just means business, businesses. All right, so businesses. Now, this can get pretty these concepts can become pretty complicated. We can make them complicated, um, but you know we can also throw in here not-for-profit organizations uh, and some other organizations, uh, government organizations. But we're not. We're gonna. We're only gonna uh, make it very simple. We have a relationship between households and firms. Okay, so businesses and individuals. And one of the things that I have said before, uh, hopefully you have written somewhere in your notes, is that. People mostly live to consume, and what they're consuming we call products, okay? So we have products that people consume and businesses produce, okay? Because I have said previously that businesses, their primary purpose is to produce, and sell, so they produce and sell products. And people, they enjoy buying and consuming, buy, 
slash consume, people enjoy buying and consuming products. Okay, so that's kind of the bottom half of our circular circular flow diagram. Uh, but then the question is this, is how do firms produce and sell products? We understand people buying the products and consuming them, and why are they consuming them? For utility, right? They're consuming the products for utility. And why are firms selling the products? They're selling them for, uh, for um, profit, right? They want to maximize their profit. So firms want to maximize profit by selling products to people who buy and consume those products so that they can have utility because they want to maximize their utility. Okay? Uh, the problem is, is that uh, uh, businesses are not able to produce uh, products out of thin air. They can't just conjure up out of thin air. That would be pretty awesome if we had some sort of you know, Harry Potter magical thing where they just magically produce a pizza and then sell it to a person who then consumes the pizza and enjoys it. So firms... Uh, need to use resources to, to produce. And where do they get those resources? Well, what do we call the resources? We call them factors of production. We've already discussed this as well. Land, labor, and capital, entrepreneurship. Mostly we're going to focus on land, labor, and capital. Okay? So we're going to put up here factors. That's going to be at the top of our circular flow. Factors. Okay? And so firms, businesses, they buy and consume factors. They buy, uh, you know what I'm going to put here? I'm going to put buy slash rent because they don't buy all of their, sometimes they only rent some of the factors of production. In particular, labor. Uh, businesses do not buy human beings. Th that would be slavery, so they don't do that. They borrow and pay for what they borrow from human beings, and that would, we call that rent in economics. Okay, So they buy and rent to consume. Now, they're not consuming the, pr the people. They're consuming the, the... And they're not always consuming all the stuff. They're consuming a portion of the life of the person. And some, let's say they're using a, a, a truck. They don't always, they don't eat the truck, but they use a portion of the life of the truck in order to make stuff. And then, uh, so here's the idea in the circular flow diagram is that, uh, and there's a little, I got, a, I got an issue with what I'm about to draw, but I'm going to do it the classical way anyways. Um, and that is that households are the ones that produce, or that provide those factors, okay? They provide slash sell the factors of production to businesses. Uh, and then the businesses use those factors of production to produce and sell products to households who buy and consume for utility. And then so that they can have the money to buy and consume, they go work at the businesses, they provide themselves as factors of production. Humans are factors of production, they're labor in the businesses so that they can produce and sell products. And, th and that's why we understand this as a circular flow diagram. Uh, so what we're looking at right now, and it's not done, is we have a, uh, we have a clockwise movement of factors that are used by businesses to produce products which are purchased by households to consume uh, and the households then provide factors of production again to the firms so that they can produce products so that households can buy them and consume them. Okay, so that is the, that's the circular flow diagram. So here's the thing is how do households uh, buy from firms. Well, they, they give, I'm going to use a different color here. I'm going to switch over to uh, purple, I guess. Well, what they do is they give their money to businesses. So they give their money, they go to the store, and I'm going to put that right here in just a minute, but I'm not putting the word store, okay? And then uh, when they buy it at the store, that money is going to the business. And so this purple line is basically just money. As the product goes this way to the people, money goes the other way to the business because businesses want to earn a profit. Okay, um, And what we call that, instead of calling it a store, we're going to call it a market. 
Okay, so this is a market for products or a product market. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about product markets in this class. Uh, similarly, how do firms get the factors from the households? Well, they pay them. They send their money this direction and in a market, which we call a factor market, a market for factors of production, and then that money is going to the households because those households are the ones who are providing that money. And what you're looking at, I'm going to soup this up just a little bit in a minute, but what you're looking at here very simply is what we call the circular flow diagram. Okay, um, And so this explains the relationship between households and firms. While firms are trying to maximize profit, households are trying to maximize utility by buying products, and they need money to be able to buy products, so they sell themselves temporarily or rent themselves out as factors of production, labor, to the businesses so that the businesses can produce the products for the households to consume. And it's circular. It just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. As long as we don't have anything stopping or inhibiting this, this system here, it's just going to go on forever. Businesses are just going to keep producing uh, stuff for people to consume. They're going to keep working for businesses so that they can have money to buy their products and consume. And everybody's happy here. So I want to uh, throw a couple things in here that you're going to uh, add to here. Um, I want to remind you that, uh, well, the first thing I want to I tell you is that in the product markets, this money thing, the households, the people are buyers. People buy, households buy in the product markets, and businesses sell in the product market. So we've got our buyers and our sellers in the product market. But when we go to the factor market, the businesses are the buyers and the households are the sellers. Okay, so it, so it flips. Now the households are the sellers. What are they selling? They're selling themselves temporarily, renting themselves out to businesses who are buying the time of people. Okay, so firms are both buyers and sellers depending on whether they're in a factor market or in a product market. And people are buyers or sellers depending on whether they are in a product market or a factor market. Okay, so that really matters. And we're going to spend time in this unit talking about product markets for a little while. And then at the end of the unit, we're going to spend at least a couple lessons talking just about factor markets. Okay, because even though they have a lot of things that are similar, there are some things that are peculiar to factor markets that are not an issue in product markets. All right. Uh, all right, so I want to throw one more thing on here, and I want to remind you, do you remember, and think about the exercise that we just did, that the money that is received by businesses is called total revenue, right? Total revenue. And in a way, we can also say that the money that is received by households is also total revenue, right? Total revenue. And something that I want to remind you about total revenue is the way that we calculate total revenue is we multiply price times quantity. And so the money that's received by businesses who are sellers for the products that they produce and sell, okay, um, are uh, the way you can determine how much money is you just take the price that they're charging and multiply it by how many they're selling. So it's always a price times quantity. It's the same thing for households. You know, if I go get a job, price times quantity. If I go get a job making $12 an hour, that's my price. The quantity is the number of hours I work. So it's always a relationship between price and quantity. And I want to remind you the warm up that you just did that we can represent price and quantity on a coordinate plane where the quantity is on the horizontal axis and the price is on the vertical axis. And when we do this, okay, this, this, uh, when we put the price on the vertical axis and the quantity on the horizontal axis, this shape right here, this coordinate plane in the positive positive, in quadrant one 
of the, of the two-dimensional coordinate plane, we call this a market graph. We call it a market graph, and we're going to get a lot more into that later, okay? And so what's going on here is this buying and selling and trading of money based on a price and a quantity can all be understood on a market graph, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about market graphs, okay? That's all I have for the circular flow diagram. It'd be a good idea to know this pretty well. And in this video, I'm going to explain something that isn't necessarily popular uh, within the subject of economics. It's not that uh, economics uh, probably thinks this concept is very important, but it's usually taught more in a business class. So what I'm about to show you right now, I'm going to sort of modify it so that we can understand it from an economics point of view. But if you're a business major, this is going to be really helpful for you. It's a nice preview for something that you would eventually learn anyway, especially if you're a marketing person or if you're a finance person. It's a big deal. Okay? All right. It's what we call in business, we call it the value chain. The value chain. Now, there's a lot of ways to understand the value chain. I'm not going to get into too many specifics. I'm just giving a general understanding of the value chain. But the idea with the value chain is that um, when you buy a product, like let's say that you buy a hamburger at, um, at Burger King, that there was a lot of stuff that went into making that hamburger, and there were a lot of people who were involved in making that hamburger. You know, uh, there, was the, uh, there was the cow obviously, very important, and the person who owned the cow or the business that owned the cow uh, had to uh, either sell the cow to the slaughterhouse or, or the, they owned the slaughterhouse, but they had to take the cow over to the slaughterhouse, they had to kill the cow, then they had to send the cow to a, I don't know, some sort of butchery of some sort where they would cut the cow apart, they would take all, you know, the skin off the cow, the innards out of the cow, they would take uh, all the meat, you know, all the meat that they're going to use off the cow, and then they might send it to even another place in large pieces of meat, and then this other place would take the large pieces of meat and cut them up into smaller pieces of meat and ground some of the meat into hamburger, right? Then that hamburger might be turned into hamburger patties, which are then frozen, then they're boxed up and maybe sent to a warehouse, a refrigerated warehouse, then shipped from the refrigerated warehouse uh, to, a, to a food distributor, and then the distributor would ship the, the box of hamburger patties over to uh, Burger King, where they can cook the hamburger. And then don't forget that we have to do the exact same thing for the bread with the wheat and the flour. Uh, we have to do the same thing for the ketchup with the vinegar, and with the tomatoes uh, and the sugar. And we have to do the same thing with the pickles and the cheese. Now the cheese came out of a cow, but they didn't kill the cow, right? They just took the milk from the cow and they made cheese. So there's a lot of stuff that went into making this cheeseburger. And all that stuff, we call that, one way of referring to all that stuff that happens, we call that adding value along the way. And it's a chain of events that occur, a chain of events where value is added at each link in the chain, and that is referred to as the value chain. And so the basic idea in the value chain goes like this, is that uh, some sort of raw material, okay, we're going to say raw material is, um, is harvested. So some raw material is harvested. So we have the company that harvests the raw material. Then that is usually sent to another company that is going to process. They're going to take the raw material and they're going to process it, you know, like processing the cow into meat that can be sold. So then we have processors, okay, a company that is a processor of the raw material. Then, after they process the raw material, what they're going to do is they're going to send that raw material to a company that's actually going to produce an intermediate product. Okay? And here's what I'm going to call that. I'm going to call that the parts, the parts producer. Okay? And that's going to be the company that takes the meat and turns it into hamburger patties. So they, they're going to get processed meat. From the, when I say processed, I don't mean like in an evil chemical way. I mean, although they do that also. What I mean is that, that they're just, they're turning it from a cow into something usable. 
uh, because this company, the, the ones that make the hamburgers, they don't want you sending them a bunch of cows. They just want the meat. They don't want all that extra stuff. Okay, so the raw material processor is going to send the meat to the parts producer. They're going to make the hamburger patties. And then usually what will happen is after they make the hamburger patties and freeze them up, they're going to send them over to what I call a parts distributor. Now, the parts distributor, they get all different kinds of foods. They don't just get the hamburger patties. Okay, they get hamburger patties, they get sausage links, they might only deal in meat, but they also might deal in other kinds of foods. Okay, but they're experts, they have lots of customers that all want to buy hamburger patties. Okay, and they're the distributors. So they have a warehouse where they store all kinds of hamburger patties, they have small hamburger patties, large hamburger patties. They might have chicken wings there, so they're also getting parts of chicken. There's the people who, who produce the bags, like Tyson, they produce the bags of chicken, and then they'll send them to the distributor who would then sell the, sell the bags of chicken or the boxes of meat over to the, to the what I call the consumable producer. Now, this is the company that is going to make the stuff into something that people actually want to consume. People don't want to eat a frozen hamburger patty. They want to eat a hamburger. Okay. Um, now, the next one that I'm going to put in here isn't always like Burger King. For Burger King, Burger King is the consumables producer. Okay. So they get all their, uh, all their stuff from the parts distributor. There's a warehouse that sends them uh, buns. and Well, probably not buns. The warehouse sends them um, uh, meat and ketchup and cheese and all kinds of other stuff. Okay, these are, uh, if you've ever heard of the company Golden State Foods, which actually is here in Conyers, I'm in Conyers, if you didn't know where I was, uh, Conyers, Georgia. We have a company uh, in Conyers, Georgia called Golden State Foods. This is what they do. They're a parts distributor. They ship all over the place. Uh, down in Florida, there's a company called Cheney Brothers. You can see them right off of, the, uh, off of I-95. Cheney Brothers, that's a parts distributor. They, they ship out food to all kinds of restaurants. The restaurants, they're the consumable producer. Okay. Now, sometimes, uh, for example, the consumable producer is not selling directly to the customer. The consumable producer, for example, if they're making uh, cars, if they're making automobiles, they're going to build the car, they're going to get a whole bunch of parts, and they're going to build the car in a manufacturing plant. Then they're going to send the car to what I call a consumable, a cons I'm going to say consumables, a consumables distributor. Walmart is a consumables distributor. When you, are, when you, the buyer, are ready to just go buy the stuff that you want to buy, you're going to go to a consumables distributor. You're going to go to Walmart or you're going to go to Target. Uh, you're going to go to a car dealership to buy your car. You're going to go to the gas station to buy your gasoline. Um, whereas there's probably some place that has gasoline in huge tanks. They pump it into trucks to drive it over to the gas stations, and then the gas stations distribute the consumables to the consumer, to the consumer, which is the household, right? Consumers, or as we said in the circular flow diagram, that would be households. All right? And so... The raw material harvester sends its stuff to the raw material processor, and then they send their stuff to the parts producer. They send their stuff to the parts distributor. The parts distributor sends their stuff to the consumables producer. The consumables producer sends their stuff to the consumables distributors, and then, and then people go to the consumables di distributors and buy the final product. They buy the stuff and then they eat it or drive it or, or use it or watch it or something like that. This in business is what we call the value chain. Now here's what I want to show you about the value chain is this. I'm going to grab another color here. Is that every one of these arrows represents a market transaction. In every one of these little arrows, there is a buyer and there is a seller and money is changing hands. So here in the, the raw materials harvester is the seller and the raw materials processor is the buyer. But here, the raw material processor stop, is not the buyer down here. They're, set, they're now the seller. And then to the parts producer, they're a buyer. And then the parts producer becomes a seller to the parts distributor, and they become the buyer. 
but the parts distributor becomes the seller when they sell to the consumables producer where they're the buyer and then after they produce whatever they're making they're going to sell it to the consumables distributor then the consumables distributor becomes the seller and the consumers are ultimately the buyers okay and so money is changing hands in every one of these cases and in every one of these cases the seller is receiving total revenue, right? Which is price times quantity. Market, here, total revenue, price times quantity. Market, so for every one of these, there's a little price and quantity coordinate plane for every single one of these situations, all the way down. We got a, we've got a price and quantity coordinate plane. These are all different markets. In this case, it's the market for raw materials. In this case, it's the market for processed materials. In this case, it's the market for, uh, for parts that were produced. In this case, it's the market for parts to be distributed to consumables producers, etc., etc. Okay, I'm not going to go all the way down, but you get the idea. We have here, just in this small value chain, they can be much bigger than this, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different market transactions. And in every one of those market transactions, there is a buyer and there is a seller. And that buyer wants to consume the stuff or you know, sell, sell it off, uh, but it's the same thing as consuming. And every seller wants to make a profit. Every single one of these sellers wants to turn a profit on their market transaction. They want to maximize their profit, so they have to make a decision about quantity. What is the profit maximizing quantity in every one of these cases? Now down here we see the consumers, the households, and we say, well, they're only buyers. They're not sellers, right? No, they are sellers. Remember the circular flow diagram? Remember how we said that households provide labor. They provide labor to all of the businesses. So look at this. We're now going to have new arrows. The consumers provide labor to all of these businesses. They produce, so we're going to put labor. They provide labor to the raw material harvester because somebody is working for the raw material harvester. Another person is working for the raw material processor. Another person is wor working for the parts producer. Another person is working for the parts distributor. Another person is working for the consumables producer. And then there's even somebody working over at Walmart or at the car dealership. In fact, you may have a family member that works at Walmart or Target or a car dealership, right? So this brown, all these brown arrows here, these represent the factor markets. Now, in particular, here's what I want to do, because I want to break off of this factor markets. Here's my contention with the circular flow diagram, is that we have land, labor, and capital, right? Land, labor, and capital. Let me write these out, okay? So we've got land, labor, and capital. Now, in the world that we live in, I'm not going back 300 years, but the world we live in right now for the most part, land and capital, those are provided by other businesses, not by consumers. Consumers are strictly providing labor to all of these businesses, not land and capital. And if one of these consumers is providing land, they're probably providing it through a business, like an LLC or something like that, a business that they own. So what I'm going to do is we're going to stop saying like the circular flow diagram, we're going to stop saying that, uh, that consumers provide all factors to these businesses, and we're just going to say that they provide labor only. So we're going to say that these brown arrows represent the labor market. And at the end of this unit, when we talk a lot about uh, factor markets, we're going to focus mostly on the labor market. We're not... Uh, the Capital and land, they behave more like products, but we are going to try and apply them to factor markets anyways, but we're mostly going to focus on labor markets, okay? All right, so there's the value chain. Uh, I've got one more diagram to show you.
what we're going to do now is we're going to continue with this series of three diagrams so that we can understand uh, markets, so that we can understand the buyers and the businesses that participate in markets. Okay, That's ultimately where we're going here is that we want to understand markets and we want to understand the idea of buyers and sellers and the idea that there are two different kinds of markets that we examine in microeconomics product markets and factor markets okay so one of the key things that happened in that we talked about in the value chain was the fact that there were businesses selling to other businesses right okay we had the value chain the only time that the consumers were purchasing was at the very end of the value chain. But in the middle of the value chain, we had the, you know, the harvester was selling to the processor, the processor was uh, selling to the parts producer, the producer was selling to the distributor. There were businesses selling stuff, products, to other businesses. And those other businesses when they bought that stuff, they were using it to produce something final that could then be sold to a consumer. And so one of the things that I feel like is missing from the circular flow diagram is that businesses that sell products to consumers are buying their land and their capital from other businesses, not from households. And so what I've done here is this, is I'm about to modify the circular flow diagram. We still have our households, which are consumers, our people, over here on the left. And over here on the right, I have broken up firms into two categories. It's what we call, or at least the phrase used to go, I assume it still probably goes like that. Uh, we call them B2B, that means business to business. These are companies that they are businesses selling to other businesses. They are B2B. They are businesses selling to businesses. And then we have B2C, which is business to consumer or business to customer. Okay. Uh, although I don't like the word customer because a business can be a customer. Okay. So really what we're going to say is business to consumer or B2C. So we have two kinds of businesses and this is good for you if you plan on going into business yourself or getting a degree in business. It's important to understand that there are different kinds of dynamics, different kinds of market dynamics if you're dealing in a B2B market or a B2C market. Okay. There's a lot of emotion in this B2C market. But up here, there's a lot of, hey, let's make a lot of money. We'll lower your costs so that you can increase your profits. Because the buyers from B2B firms are trying to maximize their profit, where the buyers from B2C firms are trying to maximize their utility. Okay, So here's the thing. We know that, uh, that the firms that are selling to consumers are selling products, right? but they are consumer products. So we're going to say consumer products. Okay, businesses, they're producing consumer products and selling those consumer products to consumers. Okay, so produce and sell consumer products. Households are buying and, and consuming. Buying and consuming buy and consume. They buy and consume consumer products, okay, like a, like a cheeseburger from, from Burger King or a Chick-fil-A sandwich or waffle fries, okay? Must be kind of hungry. I'm talking about food a lot. Uh, or maybe you're buying uh, a hairbrush from Walmart, okay, or some toilet paper from Target, okay? These are things that you plan to consume. You don't plan to sell them to somebody else. You're going to use them in your house so that you can have a happy and comfortable life. All right, now, we know that households are selling labor, right? They're, they're renting themselves out. They're selling their time so that businesses can produce. But both kinds of businesses need people. So we're going to draw a line from households to B to C and also from households over to B to C. And in this case, I mean, I forgot to, to jam, a, give some space for writing in here make some space for writing, this, what they're providing is labor, uh, the labor factor. They are providing the labor factor
to both kinds of businesses. You've got people who work for businesses that sell to other businesses, and then you have people who work for businesses that sell to consumers. I've worked for both kinds of companies in my life. Uh, my first job was working for McDonald's. That was a business to consumer. And then I did also work for Sam's Club. Now, Sam's Club sells to consumers, but Sam's Club also sells to businesses. So uh, I also worked for a manufacturing company that made office supplies, and they would sell to other businesses. All right. So households provide labor to both of these kinds of businesses. But here's the reason. Now we're going to get to why I broke this up. Business-to-business -business firms are going to sell land and labor to these other kinds of businesses. They're going to sell land and, not labor, sorry, land and capital. So, for example, uh, Burger King needs spatulas, right? To, well, no, they don't. They put them on the, the grill thing. Sorry, McDonald's needs spatulas, right? Well, there's a business that makes spatulas, and they sell them to McDonald's. Uh, Burger King needs a cash register, right? Well, there's a company that makes cash registers, and they're going to sell that cash register, which is capital, to Burger King so that Burger King can ring up and get money from their customers, okay, and safely store their cash. All right, so here, households are, produ are, are providing labor to both of these kinds of businesses, and business-to-business -business firms are producing, they're producing and selling land and capital, raw materials, and also produced materials. Now, when they sell capital, here's the key. This relationship here between business to business and business to consumer is exactly the same as this relationship between business to consumer and households. Okay? They are producing a product, which we call capital, but because it's not being used for utility, it's being used for profit, um, the business to consumer firm is going to buy it as capital. If it was being used for, you know, one of the biggest differences between capital uh, and a consumer product, which you can also call capital under certain circumstances, is that capital, let's use a different color here, is used for profit. The capital is being used to produce profit where over here, consumer, prof, uh, consumer products are being used, they're being consumed for utility. And that's the biggest thing that differentiates a business-to-business -business firm and a business-to-consumer firm. Business-to-consumer firms are selling products for utility. Business-to-business -business firms are selling products for profit, meaning not their profit, meaning they're selling the capital to this company so that this company can make a profit. Now, does this company want to make a profit? They sure do. And oftentimes, we already said in the value chain, didn't we say that some of these businesses sell to each other? The raw materials producer or harvester sells to the raw material processor. The processor sells to the, to the parts producer. The parts producer sells to the distributor. So what's happening in here, it's the last thing I'm going to put on here, I think, is that they are selling to themselves, but not, not to the same business. Business-to-business -business firms are selling to other business-to-business -business firms. And what are they selling? They're selling land and capital for the purposes of making a profit. For the purpose of the, of the buyer, the buyer uh, wants or makes profit. Where over here, the buyer buyer buys for buys for utility okay and so this is what i call the modified circular flow now i want to remind you that when households uh, provide their labor these businesses pay them money right they pay them money which is the the, the household's revenue which is price times quantity making it a market transaction and down, over here the business to business, they're selling for money. And so this business, these business to business, they're making money, they're making revenue. And down here, the businesses selling to the households are also making money. And their total revenue is also price times quantity, which results in a market transaction price and quantity. So we got market transaction here, market transaction here, market transaction here. 
Over here, it's a labor factor market. So that's the key. The main things I want you to get out of this is this is a factor market for labor. This is a, I should put the word factor here. This is also a factor market, but this is the factor market for land and capital. But down here, we have a product market, right? For consumers, a product market, okay? And so when I say product market, I'm mostly concerned with consumers, but I can also, because these, this capital here is also a product, I wouldn't call it a product market, I would call it a factor market. Okay, and I'm going to pull that all together in this in, in the next video to just sort of summarize the way we're going to look at markets. All right, folks, I want to wrap up what we're learning here from all this stuff. Okay, now in addition to understanding all these basic ideas here, uh, I want to pull it together and explain to you why I modified the circular flow diagram, uh, and I couldn't modify the circular flow diagram until we talked about the value chain here, right? Um, so here's what I basically want to show you, okay? I'm going to pull this, this uh, board in. Um, is what we're talking about, what we're about to learn about, what you're about to learn about are markets. And you need to understand what a market is. The definition of a market that we're going to use for this class is a, quote, place. When I say place, it doesn't have to be a physical geographic location because, because uh, for example, eBay online is a market, but it's a digital place. Okay, so place is a, is a loose term, but it is a place where buyers and sellers, buyers and sellers meet. That's usually where the definition typically stops in an economics class, but I'm going to add a couple more words. It's a place where buyers and sellers meet. Anytime a buyer gets together with a seller and then they make a transaction. Okay, so I'm going to say that and make. Now, this is actually redundant, putting and make uh, a transaction, a buying and selling transaction. Let me tell you why it's redundant. Because you're not a buyer unless you bought, and you're not a seller unless you sold. So technically, just saying a place where buyers and sellers meet is fine. But I want to clarify that if two people get together, one, one's wanting to buy and another one's wanting to sell. Let's say some guy wants to sell his car, and somebody else comes to his house and looks at the car. If the buyer does not buy and the seller does not sell, so no transaction was made, then that was not a market. It didn't happen. Okay, it's not a market unless the, unless there's actually a transaction of money and product. Okay, or service. But we're gonna call everything product right now. Okay. All right. So here's what I want to show you about this. That's our definition of market. And what I want to show you is that typically in a in a principles of economics uh, microeconomics class, is we look at two different kinds of markets. We look at product markets, and we look at factor markets, okay? And the problem is, is that we have three different kinds of factors. We have labor, we have land, and we have uh, capital. And then products are typically considered to be consumer goods, okay? Uh, consumer products, okay? But when we look at factor markets, a lot of the dynamics that we look at, a lot of the things that we discuss when we talk about factor markets in microeconomics only, only apply to labor. And many of those concepts do not apply to land or capital. Also, in addition, when we talk about product markets, a lot of the dynamics that occur in a product market are the exact same dynamics that are happening in the capital factor market and the exact same dynamics that are happening in the land factor market. And here's why I'm saying that. 
is because we are going to basically group consumer products, capital, and land into the discussion of product markets. And then when we talk about factor markets, we're mostly just going to talk about labor. All right? With one little caveat. When we talk about the factor market, some of the things, some of them, so if these are all the things we talk about in the factor market, these are for labor only. These other things can be applied to any factor of production. So when we do talk about factors of production, we will discuss in certain circumstances uh, labor and capital. Okay, so that's everything. Uh, that's all, that's my introduction to markets. Uh, hopefully, this made sense to you, and I hope that it'll help you um, um, uh, enjoy the rest of what you're going to learn about markets.